1918. At the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month, the guns on the Western Front famously fall silent. Official armistice ceremonies today are occasions for patriotic displays and pious sermons. But why exactly, with a decisive victory over Germany so close, did the Allied powers agree to stop fighting in the first place? In 1918, a revolutionary wave was rising in Germany, with mass strikes, mutinies and uprisings. And it wasn't only in Germany. The year before in Russia, the working class overthrew the capitalist government and seized power, ending its participation in the war. Inspired by this example, workers across the world launched struggles against their own governments. From Canada to Argentina, from Finland to Australia, from Spain to Japan, the working class shook the capitalist world to its foundations. For all the warring powers, the armistice was necessary in order to form a common front against this threat to capitalist class rule. The mass slaughter of the First World War was brought to a halt by the first great revolutionary wave of the world proletariat. August 1914 Capitalism plunges the world into imperialist war. Corroded by decades of relative peace and prosperity, most of the socialist parties and trade unions abandon the watchword of the workers' movement and call on workers to kill each other for the fatherland or for democracy. Temporarily disarmed by this betrayal, the working class is unable to resist the tide of war hysteria and ceases its struggles. But with growing hardship, hunger and the demands of the war effort, the truce cannot hold for long. In Scotland, as early as February 1915, against union orders, there are strikes by engineering workers. On the 1st of May 1916, thousands of workers in Berlin demonstrate against the war. The revolutionary Karl Liebknecht denounces the carnage and is promptly arrested. His imprisonment sparks a political mass strike. There are strikes in Austria, in France, in Petrograd. At the front, troops fraternise. There are growing desertions and mutinies. In the factories, in the streets and in the trenches, a revolutionary wave is rising. In February 1917, the Tsarist regime in Russia is deposed by the action of the working class, but the new capitalist government continues the war. Over the summer, there are strikes and uprisings in Italy and Germany against food shortages and against the war. Finally, in October 1917 in Russia, workers and soldiers councils led by the Bolshevik party overthrow the government and end its participation in the war. For the first time in world history, the working class holds power in a capitalist country. But, encircled by enemies, the Russian workers know their only hope is the spreading of the world revolution, especially to the capitalist heartlands of Europe and America. Despite their own hunger, they send trainloads of wheat to help the German and other workers. Soldiers and workers throughout the world seize on the Russian Revolution as a rallying cry to end the war once and for all. In January 1918, Hungarian workers strike against the war and in solidarity with the Russian workers, forming workers' councils. Within days, 700,000 workers are on strike throughout the empire. In Germany, more than a million workers are on strike in 50 cities. The first international mass strike in history extends right across Central Europe. In different languages, the same slogans are raised. There is also an uprising in Finland. Armed workers occupy government buildings. In France, in May 1918, a strike wave hits the armament industries, spreading to the whole Loire region and then to a quarter of a million workers in Paris. The fiasco of the final military offensives convinces workers that the only way to stop the war is through their own struggle. After massive strikes and demonstrations, on the 3rd of November, the Habsburg Empire withdraws from the war. In Germany, the Kaiser attempts to democratise the regime, releasing Karl Liebknecht from prison and bringing the Social Democrats into the government so he can demand the last drop of blood of the German people. 
but sailors at Kiel refuse to obey officers who want to make a suicidal last stand, hoisting the red flag over the fleet and organising a workers' council with city workers. Within a few days, the insurrection spreads to the main German cities. When it reaches Berlin on the 9th of November, the German ruling class calls for an armistice in order to confront the workers' struggles. The wave begins to crest. Workers' councils are formed in the Netherlands, in Norway, in Poland. In Germany, workers' and soldiers' councils take control of cities. Revolutionary sailors occupy government buildings in Berlin. In Austria, a republic is proclaimed, but demonstrations of tens of thousands of workers call for the dictatorship of the proletariat. In Spain, there is a general strike in Barcelona of more than 100,000 workers. In Hungary, Workers' councils declare a Soviet republic. Encouraged by the spreading of the world revolution, workers seize power in Bavaria. In Moscow, at the initiative of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, the third or communist international is formed to replace the second after its collapse in 1914. Its founding congress calls for the worldwide overthrow of capitalism by the workers' councils led by a world communist party. Workers in North and South America, Africa and Asia fully participate in this revolutionary wave in some cases taking control of whole cities and forming their own workers' councils or Soviet-type organisations. In May 1917 in Brazil, encouraged by news of revolution in Russia, strikes break out in Rio de Janeiro. In July, a mass strike breaks out in the Sao Paulo region against the intolerable cost of living and especially against the war. In what becomes known as the Sao Paulo Commune, workers take control of the city. A mass strike also grips Eastern Australia for five months in reaction to the war. It spreads from the railways to the mines and the docks, involving nearly 100,000 workers who form their own defence committee. In 1918, Japan is swept by the biggest wave of struggles in its history against the effects of the war. From major industrial centres and coal fields to rural fishing villages, thousands of workers fight for higher wages and better working conditions. In 1919 in Buenos Aires, after the murders of four striking workers, a general strike brings the city to a halt, provoking further repression. Workers raid armouries and form militias. After a week of street fighting and artillery bombardments, 3,000 workers are left dead or wounded. In Seattle, a strike by shipyard workers spreads to the rest of the city. Through mass assemblies, workers control supplies and organise self-defence against government troops. 400,000 steel workers also strike, confronting the US Army. In South Africa, a strike for higher wages by white workers spreads to all of Johannesburg. The strike committee forms a Soviet. Highly disciplined and well-organised strikes by black miners and other workers also break out, but racial divisions prevent the unification of the struggles. In Winnipeg, a general strike is almost total, with a strike committee organising essential services. Thousands of returning soldiers show solidarity with the workers. The strike spreads to 20 other towns and cities. Charges by mounted police cause many injuries. Two strikers are killed. The city is put under military occupation. Everywhere, workers are faced with ruthless repression and violence at the hands of the police, military and hired thugs. Faced with the worldwide threat to its rule, the capitalist class drops the mask of democracy. Even in peaceful Switzerland, in November 1918, troops occupy Zurich and Bern after workers strike against government attempts to introduce compulsory labour. 
This provokes a general strike by 400,000 workers. The government responds by mobilising 100,000 troops against the strikers. And in democratic Britain, in Glasgow in January 1919, where 100,000 workers are on strike, a peaceful workers' rally is attacked by the police. Fearing an insurrection, the government puts the city under military occupation with tanks and armed troops in the streets. All the capitalists, from Tsarist generals to parliamentarians and democrats, now unite to crush the Russian Revolution. Japanese troops occupy Siberia, and French, British, Canadian, Italian and American armies all intervene to back the forces of the counter-revolution. Workers organise action to defend their Russian comrades, and there are strikes and refusals to load ships bearing arms to crush the revolution, as well as mutinies by the troops sent. The capitalist armies are eventually forced to withdraw, but the Western democracies continue their attempts to strangle the Russian Revolution. In the European heartlands of capitalism, having betrayed the working class by supporting the war, the social democratic parties and the trade unions now become the spearhead of the capitalist counter-offensive. In Germany, the Socialist Party, the trade unions and the military high command all join forces, first provoking the workers in Berlin to launch a premature insurrection, then isolating and crushing the uprisings in Bremen, the Rhineland, the Ruhr and central Germany, then again in Berlin in March 1919. Over a thousand workers are killed. Many, including the revolutionary leaders Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, are executed on the spot by the ex-army Freikorps, commanded by the socialist leader Gustav Noska, the self-styled bloodhound of the revolution. The Bavarian Council Republic is now alone. Munich is starved out, and a hundred thousand troops put down the insurrection. Thousands of workers are killed in the fighting, or are summarily executed. Among the troops of this white terror are future Nazi leaders Himmler and Hess, encouraged by a government that calls itself socialist. In Austria, the Young Communist Party is also provoked into a premature insurrection, which is sabotaged by the Social Democrats and swiftly crushed. In Hungary, the Communists tragically unite with the Socialists. The capitalists hand power to the new unified party, but the capitalist state remains intact. From the outside, Britain and France orchestrate an invasion to crush the revolution. The workers manage to beat back the invading armies. But in July 1919, the Social Democrats and the Unions form a new government which brutally represses the workers. Romanian troops then enter Budapest, before handing the country over to Admiral Horty, a future Nazi collaborator, who unleashes a reign of terror in which more than 5,000 workers are tortured and killed. Horty's vicious dictatorship receives the grateful support of the Western democracies. For workers in the so-called victorious countries, these defeats weigh heavily. And here also, it is the trade unions which are at the forefront of protecting capitalism from revolution. In 1920 in France, a wave of wildcat strikes erupts on the railways and spreads to other sectors. The CGT union places itself at the head of the movement to prevent it spreading, breaking workers' solidarity by keeping the different sectors divided. The rail workers are defeated and demoralised. In Italy, there is a wave of factory occupations involving half a million workers across the country. The unions raise the demand for workers' control over production to prevent the movement from taking to the streets and confronting the capitalist state. Imprisoned in the factories, the movement is defeated, opening the door to the victory of fascism. In Britain, the miners call for a general strike. The government sends troops into the coal fields. Machine guns are mounted at pitheads. But the transport and railway unions refuse to back the miners, who eventually return to work out of hunger. Wage cuts for millions of workers follow. In the United States, workers in the coal fields and on the railroads face the murderous violence of company thugs and the National Guard, as well as union sabotage. They also suffer serious defeats. In Germany, against a military coup, the trade unions call for a general strike to defend the socialist government. Workers in the Ruhr arm themselves and form an 80,000 strong Red Army. The coup is swiftly put down. 
For the workers, it is not a question of defending the government, and in some cities they even arrest union and socialist leaders. But their struggle remains isolated, and the reformed German army crushes the uprising. Thousands of workers are tortured and shot. In 1921, the German ruling class goes on the offensive against the workers. Despite heroic resistance, the workers' response is dispersed, and further massacres follow. These defeats for the revolutionary wave in Europe leave the Russian Revolution fatally isolated. After a Polish invasion in 1920, attempts by the Bolsheviks to export the revolution westwards using the Red Army only served to rally Polish workers behind their own ruling class. In Russia itself, the war and the blockade backed by the Western democracies leaves the economy devastated. The entire country is on the verge of starvation. In the cities, the working class is exhausted. The Soviets no longer function as organs of working class power. At the head of the state machine, but increasingly imprisoned by it, the Bolshevik party resorts to harsh and bureaucratic methods to deal with the problems the country faces. In 1921, there are strikes and demonstrations by workers in Moscow. A wave of wildcat strikes erupts in Petrograd against intolerable living conditions and the lack of Soviet democracy. State repression of the protests provokes the revolt by revolutionary sailors and workers at the strategic naval fort of Kronstadt. Believing that they are facing a counter-revolutionary conspiracy, Bolshevik leaders order the Red Army to crush the rebellion. Hundreds of insurgents are massacred on the spot, condemned to death or sent to labour camps. This use of violence against the working class by a state supposedly controlled by the workers themselves, an unprecedented situation in the history of the workers' movement, reveals the degeneration of the first proletarian revolution from within. Abroad, the Bolsheviks try to build support for the Russian state by making secret deals with the capitalist powers and by calling for a united front with the same social democrats and trade unions who have spearheaded the capitalist counter-offensive. When French and Belgian troops occupy the Ruhr in 1923, the Communist International and its German party even call for an alliance with the Nazis in order to build national unity against the invasion. And in October that year, they try to provoke an insurrection in Hamburg, but when the workers rise up in revolt, the Communist Party retreats, leaving workers to face the repression. The way is now open to the rise of fascism in Germany, which finishes off the work of the Social Democrats and trade unions. In 1926, when the unions in Britain finally call a general strike, only to call it off again ten days later, the capitalist state is completely prepared. The resulting defeat of the British workers marks the end of the revolutionary wave in Europe. In China, where the Communist International calls on workers to support the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek, more than half a million workers take control of the city of Shanghai in 1927. The insurrection is brutally crushed by these same nationalist forces in an orgy of executions. The final defeat of the world revolutionary wave seals the victory of Stalinism, which buries the Russian Revolution, destroying all surviving opposition and imposing a monstrous reign of terror on the entire population. The Communist International wants the clearest expression of all the working class's revolutionary hopes and ideas, abandons internationalism when it adopts Stalin's policy of socialism in one country. In the same way as the Social Democrats and trade unions betrayed the working class in August 1914, the Communist parties eventually call on workers to kill each other, only this time for the motherland or for democracy. With the triumph of Stalin in Russia and Hitler in Germany, the defeat, demoralisation and despair of the working class is complete. In the words of the Russian revolutionary Victor Serge, this is midnight in the century. Having risen to such heights and shaken the capitalist system to its very foundations, the working class is now plunged into the deepest and longest counter-revolution in its history. The entire capitalist class, terrified at the prospect of its own death, seeks not only revenge, but to expunge the very idea of proletarian revolution from history. Faced with the collapse of its system in a worldwide depression, capitalism can only survive 
by accelerating its drive towards war. With the working class no longer able to pose its own revolutionary alternative, the road is open to a second imperialist world war and even greater, hitherto unimaginable, depths of barbarism. This time the capitalists are determined to prevent any repetition of the first revolutionary wave. The democratic allies, as well as the Nazis and the Stalinists, act swiftly to crush any sign of workers' resistance. The German proletariat is singled out as the most dangerous potential threat and systematically subjected to firebombing, military occupation and terror. With the world left in ruins, capitalist order reigns. The working class is asked to rebuild a devastated world in exchange for the crumbs which the reconstruction of the shattered world economy enables the capitalists to hand out. But after two decades of euphoric growth, the capitalist system again finds itself faced by a nightmare it thought it had banished, the economic crisis. And with the crisis, a revival of workers' struggles. A new, undefeated generation of workers takes to the streets in massive struggles not seen since the revolutionary wave. May 1968 in France sees the biggest general strike ever. But it's not just in France. These struggles announce the return of the working class to the stage of history. Today, almost 50 years later, after many more waves of struggle, along with many more defeats and temporary retreats, massacres and wars, the working class has not yet been able to pose its own revolutionary alternative, even though the capitalist crisis is now much deeper but its struggles still act as a break on capitalism's drive towards generalised war and even greater barbarism. Despite all the difficulties and obstacles in its way, the road is still open to a new revolutionary wave, the final revolutionary wave of the world proletariat, which will finally succeed in overthrowing capitalism and abolishing this system of terror, hunger and exploitation once and for all. Thank you.